And we are back with part seven of this week's teaching of the Messianic Jewish Family Bible, Tree of Life Version, TLB. And we had we were reading from chapter 10. So I had paused it because my number had been pretty high on the counter. So hopefully that part will upload when it, it, it comes time to upload. Um, upload that. So I'm going to finish. Actually, we were pretty close to finishing chapter 10. Um, we were actually at verse 16. Then Moses searched carefully for the goat of the sin offering and noticed it had been burnt up. So he snapped at Eliezer and Itamar, the surviving sons of Aaron, saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, since it is most holy, and he gave it to you in order to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Adonai? Look, its blood was not brought into the inner part of the sanctuary. You certainly should have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. But Aaron said to Moses, Behold, today they presented their sin offering and their burnt offering before Adonai. When things like these have happened to me, would it have been good in the eyes of Adonai if I had eaten the sin offering today? Well, when Moses heard heard this, it was good in his eyes. See, ordinarily they would have had to do that, but um, actually Aaron's sons had just offered their sin offering because they were actually, they were like the second line of of Aaron's sons to be consecrated um, into the priesthood. So they had, you know, because the other two had gotten <laughs> introduced strange fire and they got consumed and ended up being dead. Um, you know, Eleazar and 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 um, Ithamar had to come forward. Um, so they were presenting their own sin offering. So. Aaron made it made it a case that, you know, this is probably not a good day for them to do that because they've just, you know, offered their own sin offering to Adonai. Um, so, you know, Moses realized that, yeah, that's OK. <laughs> um, but ordinarily, this is what they, they needed to do. And from here on out, um, they were expected to do that. So that is the end of Chapter 10 and Introducing Strange Fire. So, you know, what was happening when things weren't being done the way Adonai had said, this is what happened with uh, with Nadab and uh, Abihu. They were gone now. So now we're going to move into chapter 11, Kashrut for Holiness. And that's basically clean and unclean foods that um, were spelled out by Adonai um, for the people. And they were for, for good reasons. So we're going to start with that. Um, Adonai spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to Benai Israel, saying, These are the living things which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever has a split, divided hoof, and choose cut among the animals that you may eat. Nevertheless, you should not Eat of those that only chew cud or have split hoof. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean to you. The coney, though it chews the cud, yet does not have a divided hoof. So it is unclean to you. The hare, though it chews the cud, does not split the hoof. So it is unclean to you. The pig, though it has a split a divided hoof, does not chew cud, so it is unclean to you. You are not to eat meat from them, nor are you to touch these carcasses. They are unclean to you. From all that are in the waters, you may eat whatever has fins and scales within the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers. Those you may eat. But any that do not have fins and scales in the seas or the rivers among those that swarm on the waters, or among any of the living creatures that are in the waters, they are loathsome to you. They are to be detestable to you. You shall not eat meat from them, and you shall detest their carcasses. Whatever has neither fins nor scales in the waters, that is a detestable thing to you. Among the birds, you should detest the following. They are not to be eaten. Um, they are loathsome. The eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, and any kind of black kite, 
any kind of raven, the horned owl, the screech owl, the gull, any kind of hawk, the little owl, the, the cormorant, and that's C-O-R-M-O-R-A-N-T, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the, the stork, any kind of heron, the hoopoe, and the bat. All flying insects that walk on all fours are detestable to you, yet you may eat from all winged creeping things that go on all fours, which have legs above their feet with which to hop on the earth. You may eat from any kind of locust, any kind of katydid, any kind of cricket, and any kind of grasshopper, but all winged creeping things that have four feet are loathsome to you. Moreover, by those Moreover, by these also you will become unclean. Whoever touches their carcasses shall be unclean until the evening. Whoever carries any part of their carcasses to wash his clothes, and it will be unclean until evening. Every animal with a separating hoof but not split or does not chew cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches them will become unclean. So whatever moves on its paws among all animals that go on all fours is unclean to you. Whoever touches their carcasses will be unclean until the evening. Whoever carries their carcasses is to wash his clothes and will be unclean until the evening. They are unclean to you. Among the creeping things that creep on the earth, the following are unclean to you. The weasel, the rat, any kind of great lizard, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the wall lizard, the this, this skink, that's S-K-I-N-K, not skunk, <laughs> and the chameleon. Among all that creep, these are the ones that are unclean to you. Whoever touches them when they are dead will be unclean until the evening. Whatever falls on them when they are dead will be unclean. Whether it is any vessel of wood or clothing or skin or sackcloth, whatever vessel it is, with which any work is done, it must be put in, into water, and it will be unclean until the evening, then it will be clean. Now, if any of them falls into a clay pot, everything that is in it will become unclean, and you are to break it. Any food that may be eaten but has water on it from such a pot will become unclean. Also, any drink that may be drunk in any such pot will become unclean. Everything on which part of their carcass falls will become unclean. An oven or stove for pots is to be broken in pieces. They are unclean and will be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or cistern for collecting water will be clean, though anyone who touches their carcass will become unclean. If part of a carcass falls on any seed for sowing that has yet to be sown, it is clean. But if the water but if water is put on the seed and part of the carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. If any animal that, that you may eat dies, the one who touches its carcass will become unclean until evening. He who eats of it, its carcass is to wash his clothes and to be unclean until evening. Also, the one who carries its carcass is to wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every creeping thing that crawls on the earth is detestable. It should not be eaten. Whatever moves on its belly or crawls on all fours or has many feet among all its creeping things that crawl on the earth, these are not to eat, for they are detestable. You are not to contaminate yourself with any creeping thing that crawls, nor make yourself unclean with them or defiled by them. For I am Adonai your God, therefore sanctify yourself and be holy, for I am holy. You are not to defile yourself with any kind of creeping thing that moves on the earth, for I am Adonai who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, therefore you shall be holy, for I am holy. This is the Torah of the animal, the bird, every living creature that moves in the waters, and every creature that creeps on the earth, to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean. And between the living thing that may be eaten and the living thing that may not be eaten. So that's a pretty uh, extensive list, you know, the clean and unclean foods. But, you know, it's pretty straightforward and pretty much the things that you wouldn't want to eat 
are on that list anyway. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to eat a rat and <laughs> um, or anything that's creeping. I mean, and there's a reason for that. And yes, it should be detestable to all of us. So anyway, um, that is cash root for holiness. And that is um, our, the clean and unclean foods um, that were established. So as you can see, as we're, we're progressing forward into this chapter, it, God is setting out instructions on how he wants his people to live, you know, um, including clean and unclean food. You know, he, he states, I'm Adonai, your God, I am holy. Therefore, I expect you to be holy as well or do the best that you can to be holy because you are my people. I have declared you as my people and I expect you to follow what I am outlining for you. And we are moving on to chapter 12. And this actually begins with Parashat Tezria. And that's T-A-Z-R-I-A. And we had mentioned that before. And um, before I, I, I move into that, I just realized that I did not mention, um, I mentioned the Umen and the Thumen. And I want to just mention a little bit what that is. So the Orem, um is spelled U-R-I-M and Thumim. No, that's, it's almost like a tongue twister there. The Orem and the Thumim. That was, get messed up there. Um, T-H-U-M-M-I-M. Um, this is an object, possibly it, it's put into the ephod or the breastplate of the of the Kohen Gadol for judgments. Um, the high priest. It is said that actually when uh, God spoke um, to the high priest, they, they would actually light up and give them an th those answers um, through the, the Urim and the Thummim. So um, it's very interesting. And I'm going to actually give you a Bible dictionary definition of the Urim and Thummim. It's a small sacred object, probably stones, which the high priest wore on his breastplate, which I, I had already said. And the method of its use is, is uncertain, but we do know that they were used to ascertain divine will. The exact nature of those sacred objects is not known. When the question of guilt was raised, the answer came by Urim. If innocent was asked, the answer came by Thummim. It may be that they cast a light or were shaken from their containers when the questions were asked. At the time of the exile, they fell into disuse. So that is the Urim and the Thummim. And actually, it was worn in the breastplate of the high priest. So now I'm going to go into chapter 12. Um, Parashat Tezria, Nida, N I D D A H. Rest for new mothers. Then Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Beniah Israel, instructing, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she will be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her Nida, she will be unclean. In the eighth day, the flesh of the, his foreskin is to be circumcised. She must wait during the blood of purification for 33 days. She is not to touch any holy thing nor come into sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. But if she bears a female child, then she will be unclean for two weeks, as in her Nita, and she is to wait in the blood of purification for 66 days. When the days of her purification are completed for a son or for a daughter, she is to bring to the Kohan at the entrance of the tent of meeting a year old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. He is to present it before Adonai and make atonement for her. Then she will be cleansed from the discharge of her blood. This is the Torah for her who gives birth, whether to a male or a female child. If she cannot afford a lamb, then she is to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, then the Kohen will make atonement for her, and she will be clean. Now, this is a little off subject, but if you remember um, 
uh, well, not not too far off subject. The the woman with the issue of blood, she actually had this issue of blood. She had ongoing bleeding, which made her unclean. And by being unclean, she was not allowed to be out in the general public. So she really took took her life in her hands. And, and she, she really had a lot of faith that if she touched the hem of, of, of Yeshua's garment, she was going to be made clean and she was going to be healed. Um, and she, but she really took, took a big risk by being out there and pushing her way through the crowd to be there because that was definitely against the laws, um, of the time. And there's a footnote here, um, actually referring to Yeshua's birth and, um, and it actually occurs in, uh, Luke. Um, chapter 2, beginning with verse 21, when eight days had passed for his, for his Britmala, and that simply is circumcision, and he was named Yeshua, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of their purification were fulfilled, according to the Torah of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present to Adonai, as it is written in the Torah of Adonai, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to Adonai. So they offered a sacrifice according to what was said in the Torah of Adonai, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So they, they definitely followed the Torah, and that was when Yeshua was born. So I am going to pause this at this point, and I am going to come back with the next part, and we're going to be um, starting with chapter 13, and this will be part 8.